I'm Ann McKay. Welcome to Trailblazers Impact Podcast with inspiring stories of women who created new paths for other women to follow. Our website is trailblazersimpact.com and you can contact us at hello at trailblazersimpact.com. In season one, Kath McGreen talked about how the IVF process works and how she struggled with dyslexia as a nurse. In season two, Kath talks about her experiences and challenges in working with IVF clients and she gives you a peek into a different kind of retirement. And now you have so many men that are going to nursing. And yes. You didn't have that, did you, back then? Very uh, many? Very, not very many. I did, throughout the years, work with some men, um, certainly more in the psych... When I was a psychiatric nurse, there was a lot more men... On at the um, private psych hospital that I worked at, it was a, just a wonderful hospital, and it was um, three different units. They had an adult, adolescent, and a child unit, and they were all locked. And it was very significant illnesses, and they did have a lot more men in that field of nursing than the other fields that I'd worked in. It sounds like you've made a lot of contribution in many ways. Describe what you feel is your most important contribution that you could think of that you have made. I feel that I was able to help many couples have the, the, their dream come true, that they were able to have a child or multiple children. I, I think that was a huge contribution that I was able to participate in. And of course that coin has two sides. What would you say is your biggest heartache? Describe a situation that would be the one of your most difficult ones you ever dealt with. I never got through one week of my entire infertility career without crying. So there was a lot of tears during those years. And I would say that that a couple that you've worked with for, say, six to nine to 18 months, I mean, our, our relationship with those couples can take a long time to assist them to get to the point where they have their dream come true or decide that they need to leave treatment. And unfortunately, a lot of times that was financially motivated why they had to leave treatment, which is just a horrible thing. Uh, anyway, to have them go through all of that, mortgage a house or whatever they had to do, you know, borrow from family, and they finally get pregnant, and then for that to end in a miscarriage or a stillborn loss was just unbearable. Can you think of someone that that happened to? Oh, yes. Um, one of the saddest cases I really had during my career was um, a lovely couple that I had worked with, and she had a history of she had a history of breast cancer. And she had been free and clear of her disease for five years. And her obstetrician felt that it was safe at that point for her to try and get pregnant. Well, by that point, she was 40 and could not get pregnant on her own. So she needed an egg donor. And so her husband and her, uh, the couple came to me and we matched them with an egg donor and we got them started with treatment and early in her pregnancy, her breast cancer came back and it metastasized to her spine. And she was able to carry the pregnancy, but died immediately after the birth of the babies. She had twins. And that I would say that was the saddest case I had. You know, 
not that it was any sadder than all those losses, either the couples that had lost their children through miscarriage or a stillborn stillbirth, but that was just devastating for that woman to never be able to have the joy of raising her children and for her husband, you know, he has his children, but then he didn't have his wife. Yeah, that was really hard. That would be terribly sad. What event or person do you think most impacted your life? I, I would say it would have to be my father. He was so important to me. And even even today, he, he's gone. He died in 2010. I think of him every day. And I, for years and years, certainly while he was alive, it was, you know, you hear people say, um, what would Jesus do? <laughs> well, I was more like, what would my dad do? <laughs> um, yeah, he was... He was a big part of who I am. He loved nature, and he got his Eagle Scout badge in Yosemite. And my parents had their uh, they had their honeymoon in, at Yosemite, and so his love of the mountains and the outdoors is definitely where that all came from. I would much rather be outside than inside any time, and. Uh, he, the things that really mattered to him, such as education or how to take care of the environment, all of that are things that I have tried to go emulate. Yeah. He, what are some, what, can you think of a serious challenge that you've had to face? A serious challenge. Yes. Um, I, during my career, for a period of time, I left direct patient care and worked for an infertility pharmacy. And I was a nurse that went around to the, the different infertility clinics across the country. And I was kind of like the payback for that infertility clinic utilizing that infertility pharmacy. And I went across the country and gave contact hour courses for reproductive health care teams. And I went from Yale to Stanford and everywhere in between. And I taught at academic, academic type university settings or private settings. And it was a wonderful time in my career, but getting over that fear of speaking in front of large crowds was hard. Now, if I'm sitting at a table surrounded by, you know, people in a room and I'm sitting and talking to a bunch of people, no problem. But when I'm standing at a podium, it's a different story. And I would speak to groups up to 2,000 people. And that that was really hard to get over. And as I went on in my career, that fear came back with a vengeance, and I did not get over it. And I don't think I could do it anymore. What would happen when you get up to the podium? Well, I would just be seized with doubt that... And I think the problem was that... I. When If I was speaking in front of a group, certainly of clinicians, I felt like they knew more than I knew. But really, in reality, the subject matter that I was speaking on generally was to lay people or to people that did not have as much experience as I did. And they didn't know exactly what my talk was supposed to have in it. And so they had no idea that anything that came out of my mouth wasn't exactly correct, but I, I would have, in the beginning, I would have fear that I was messing up and they knew it. Did you start <laughs> to sweat? Or? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know, the, that and, you know, the shaky voice. and But I did overcome it, and it got much better, and I was able to speak without too many nerves, 
But then I, I went, I ended up at University of Colorado, Colorado Hospital. And the physicians I worked with there were so bright and so fabulous. And if they were in attendance at any talk I gave, I just, I really had a problem. I really could not, I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, it was just too, too nerve wracking. What's the hardest thing that you've ever had to do? That's your challenge. Would you say the hardest thing was the overcoming the public speaking fear, or what's the hardest thing you've ever had to do? That might be it. Yeah, that was that was a biggie. I would think that was pretty tough, yeah. What would you like to have a do-over on? Oh, oh, I would love to have a do-over on my entire nursing career. <laughs> I would, I would. I feel like... I I have seen other nurses during my nursing career that attended every in-service they could possibly attend, and they, they just kept up on everything. And although I felt like I did do a good job of keeping up on everything, my biggest regret was that I was a night owl, and I, I loved to stay up late. And that would have been perfect if I had gone to bed at 9 or 10 and gotten up at 5 and had a good night's sleep. But I was always short of sleep throughout my entire career because I was not really a morning person, yet I had a job that required me to be a morning person. And I would, that is my biggest regret, that I did not make myself act like an adult and go to bed at a decent hour so I could have the best night's sleep of sleep possible so that when I got to work, I was the best nurse I could be. That's my biggest regret. And probably my biggest obstacle because I never could overcome it. I just, I, I would try, I would go to into bed. Sometimes I would try it <laughs> and I just couldn't go to sleep. Yeah, I could never. Did you try like sleeping pills? And oh no, stuff? no, because I don't want to be groggy in the morning. I could not afford to be groggy in the morning. No, I never tried a sleeping pill. I, but I just, I was a night owl. Yeah, that was, I would say that was my biggest obstacle and my biggest regret. Tell me about the relationship with your mother. My mother and I did not have the easiest relationship in the world. My mother was a very negative person, very pessimistic, and I am the polar opposite. I'm very optimistic. Um, I'm very happy. I'm happy all the time. The only time I really have difficulties is if I'm staying in a climate that has gray skies all the time. And I do have seasonal affective disorder. But other than that, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much happy. And I'm outgoing and I just want, I want to go, go, go. Well, she was an introvert and she, reading was her favorite thing to do. And she was pretty negative. Did you feel you had to live with criticism or just silence? No, there, well, yeah, she was, she was critical. I remember my dad coming home from work and we'd all sit down to dinner and she'd, <laughs> she'd say, now Cappy, my, my name is Catherine Page and my parents called me Cappy, my family did. And did you want to tell your father what you did today? And it was always over something negative. <laughs> she, yeah, she, she could be negative at times but she also was a good listener she was really a good listener and she would like she would really enjoy hearing all the stories that i had to, to tell when i was when i'd come home from school and she she was easy to talk to about like during high school she was those were may, maybe better years for her and she wasn't quite so negative then and I could come home and talk to her about just about anything. If you had one thing to tell her that you could tell her, what would you say? I would say that she should not have been shackled 
to the way times during her time of life um, were. And what I mean by that is she was an incredibly intelligent woman. My parents met at Berkeley, and she was like the top 1% in the country. She was exceptionally bright, and she studied archaeology. And when my dad went to Korea, they were already married, and when my dad went to Korea, she worked at the Jet Propulsion Labs in California. And I'm sure she was probably just a secretary or something, but... She was so bright, she could have done anything. She could have studied anything. She could have, and, but she didn't. The minute my dad came back from Korea, she stopped working and she had kids. And when we left and went to college, she said it was just like you all died. And, she, and her life died with her. And it's just like her she, her whole life was stunted because she didn't have a career. I think she would have loved to have had a career and loved to have been needed not only by her children, but by whatever um, career she had chosen. And I, I really wish I could have told her, but, you know, you're a product of your times, and that's just the way it goes. So she was in the 40s? Well, she went to, she had, I was her first child. I was her oldest and I was born in 55. So she was a product of the 50s. Yeah. And when all the men came back from the service, whether it was World War II or the Korean War, you were Ozzie and Harriet. <laughs> Dad went off to work and the mother stayed home in a dress, for God's sakes. You're in a dress, doing laundry and cleaning. Oh, my God, cooking in a dress. But, you know, I wasn't allowed to wear pants until I was in high school. I had to wear dresses or skirts all through school until I was in high school. So it took a long time before women's rights really got to thank God, where they are today. And we still have a long way to go. We're certainly not being paid what men get paid for the same work. And yeah, we have a long way to go. So what would you tell young women today? Oh, dream big and, and go to where your dreams are. You can study anything. You can do anything. And... If, if being at home with your children is what you want to do, more power to you. That's wonderful. But if you want to have a career and have children, you can do it. Are there sacrifices? Yes. When I was in school and my, when I went back to school and to finish my degree, my children were three, age three and age six. And Whenever I was studying, I felt guilty because I wasn't with my kids and my husband. Whenever I was with my kids and my husband, I felt guilty because I wasn't studying. It was a guilt fest. Don't do that to yourself. Just do the best you can. That's all you ever can do throughout your life. Do the best you can at any stage of your life and enjoy it, enjoy it while you're on that road to where you want to go. I, I really did love school. I loved the education I got. I loved the people that I met, whether it was my professors or my fellow students. I thought, and I, I'm glad I was able to enjoy the university experience. And I also loved my nursing career. Even though we had to move every three or four years, I don't think any of my jobs, I don't think I would have left any of those jobs I had. I was loyal to my team and loyal to the fellow nurses and physicians I worked with and, and the psychologists, those fabulous psychologists I worked with. I don't think I would have left any of those places that I worked at, but it was time to go. We had to move. Because your husband was... In the Air Force, right, right. And What was it like being the wife of a military person? 
Well, my we my husband and I calculated it, and we think that we were probably apart out of those twenty five years about four years in in total. We were either he was in a foreign place like Kuwait. He had to be in Kuwait for a full year, or he was installing hardware and software networks at different installations, or he was doing whatever he was doing. Uh, he had a top security clearance, so I did not know what he did. Um, for a four-year period of time, I would hear, well, I help the Air Force jets sp sp speak to the other branches of the military's jets. That I would that would be it. That would what I that would be what I got out of four years. <laughs> you know, I could hear about the people at work and I could hear all about them, but about what he did, no. And there would be times when he would come home and he would say, soon I'm going to come home from work and I'm going to ha tell you that I have to leave and I can't tell you where I'm going and I can't tell you how long I'm going to be there and I can't tell you when I'm coming home. But that's going to happen soon. And then all of a sudden he'd come home <laughs> and he'd say, I'm leaving tomorrow morning and I'll be back. And that's all I would know. And he could be gone two weeks or six weeks. And I had no idea. To, to this day, I have no idea where he went, what he did. So you were kind of almost like a single. Oh, mother. yeah. That, well, at times. Case. Because if an emergency happened, you yes. still couldn't reach him. You had to deal with it on your own, right? That's ac absolutely correct. And in fact, when both his mother and father died... Uh, he was really young when his father died. He was 31, I think, when his father died. I had to go through the Red Cross to get him home. And he was in, I was in Oklahoma City, and he was da in Dallas putting in a network, a computer network system. And that's how I got him home. And then when his mother died, he, I had, he was in Amsterdam, and I was in Boston, oh gosh, where, Boston, I think I was in Boston. And I had, no, I was in Oklahoma City. And I had to go through the Red Cross to get him home. And it was really difficult. Those, that was pretty difficult. Because he'd come home and, you know, he's just lost and... I'm kind of holding up the fort. Yeah, that was, that was, those were tough times. But you became strong. Yes. Oh, oh yes. Okay. Yes, I did. And I had wonderful sons. I have two sons and they were respectful and caring and they're, they're wonderful. And they, they were easy to raise without their father being there during those times that he wasn't there. Yeah. Now, what I find interesting is in your retirement, you are finally together. Yes. <laughs> so talk about what you do for the majority of the year. Well, I will. Uh, when we retired in 2013, we had lived enough of a transient lifestyle during the time that we were in the Air Force that we felt that we would love to live in a motor home and be able to travel the country. So we sold our house and it sold in 36 hours. Oh, I know the housing market had just come back, you know, from the crash in 2008. And for some reason, the, the well, we were north of Denver in near Boulder, Colorado, in a little town called the Erie, Colorado. And the housing market had ba bounced back much faster than we had realized it. And 36 hours after we put it on the market, it was sold. And we bought a motorhome, 
and we sold all of our furniture along with the house and moved, moved cold turkey into that motor home. And shrinking from a three-story house, and we lived on all three stories, three this big house into a 10 by 10 storage unit. That was, that was where our special things that we wanted to keep. No furniture though, just special things. And, and then the things that we put in our motor home, that was all we had. And we started out traveling through the mountain states and we always wintered in Arizona. We started out in Mesa, Arizona and then decided let's try Tucson. And so for five years we wintered in Tucson and we decided eventually that we wanted to buy a house. But it's the seven months out of the year that we are in our motor home. After the first year we bought a brand new one. We decided okay this is a lifestyle that we enjoy. Let's let's get a little bigger and newer. <laughs> so we went from a 2000 motor a 40 foot motor home to a 2014 42 well it's really closer to 43 foot motor home. And it's really like a luxury apartment on wheels. We were not exactly roughing it, but it it was smaller. <laughs> and we just loved it. We went to the mountain states a couple of times. We did the Midwest. We did uh, the East Coast. We did the Tennessee, Kentucky area, and we did the Pacific Northwest. And this coming summer, we are going to do the Pacific Northwest again, because the last time we were there, they were just socked in with bad weather. And we never got to see all those beautiful views that they talk about from Oregon and Washington. So we're going to try it again. But what we do in the springtime is after we leave here, about the beginning of April, we'll travel a little bit in April. And then we go to Colorado May through July. And we stay in Denver at a state park and we volunteer at Cherry Creek State Park in their campground office and that is about 20 minutes from our kids. Our Both our sons live really close to that state park and we have four grandchildren so we spend the springtime enjoying them and then about August 1st we take off and we go traveling for three months and then we arrived down here about November 1st. That's amazing. It's a wonderful life. Now, what I really wonder, what I'm curious about, is after being on your own all that time with during the service and during the kids growing up and him being away a lot of the time, much of the time you not even knowing where he was, how in the world did you make that adjustment <laughs> to having him in the house all the yes, time. Yes, <laughs> to be close to get in close yes. quarters. How did you do that? Well, I'll tell you. The reason you motor home is because you can follow the weather. And the outdoors is your next room. <laughs> so <laughs> Somebody if, had to go outside. Right. And that was me. <laughs> Generally, that was me. <laughs> so if he wants to watch something on TV that is driving me out of my mind, which is any daytime TV at all, I don't really enjoy listening to any television during the day. That's just not for me. And, you know, he'll want to watch a sports program or finance or politics or something. You know, I'm no, not, not at this hour. So I'll just go outside and I'll read and I'm into hiking and walking and working out at the gym, so I could always find things to do. So that, you find a way to coexist. Yes, yes. Even though it may be inside or out. <laughs> right, exactly. We aren't necessarily in the same room all the time, although we always spend the evening together. And I still like to cook, so I I cook cook for ourselves, and we don't go out for dinner much. We, we don't really enjoy going out to dinner very much, but we we enjoy having breakfast and lunch out if we want. So to wrap it up, what do you think is the most valuable gift 
you could give to the listeners? Do whatever you can to become an optimistic, happy person. Whether it's therapy, therapy works wonders. I went through years of therapy and it did work wonders. Uh, whether it's meditation, whether it's exercise or yoga, whatever it is, they are even saying now that eating more fruits and vegetables leads to better mental health. Whatever it is, try and get to a place where you're happy and optimistic because there's nothing like that. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed listening to another story of the impact of trailblazers. Visit our website at trailblazersimpact.com and connect with us at hello at trailblazersimpact.com. And remember, you must learn a new way to think before you can master a new way to be.